Um, one thing that um, I just want to alert the court to, Bob, and I, I'm going to bring in a, a photograph that somebody sent um, to my office, and I'll come up to the lectern if that's okay. Yes, I, well, I would think you would argue at the lectern. Well, this is just a side issue that I've asked um, Mr. Nickus to, to address the court on. Oh, the motion. okay. This is just a quick, and if it takes out of our time, it does. But, um, I, and I get many sort of invalid emails that I don't. Uh, obviously read everyone or take everyone seriously, but I, I got one last night that indicated that um, the cameras are catching Ms. Morrissey signaling witnesses um, while they're on the witness stand. And, um, you know, I, I, I really... Did I, you look Did you look to see if that was true? I, I was sent to photograph that, that concerned me, and I, I, I felt obligated, and, and like I said to the court, I, I try to not make these issues... Um, this is a high-pressure case. I've been in many. Um, there have been more issues in this case than I have ever seen in all of those cases combined. And so I'm sort of at a loss, but to bring it to the court's attention. This is the third day of the trial of actor Alec Baldwin, who has been charged with manslaughter after finding himself holding the firearm that would kill the cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the set of the Western Rust. You're up, Piotr. Your Since we did submit the written briefing, I will try to be brief, but I think it'd be helpful to build out some of the facts, so Your Honor has the chronology of how this happened and has the factual pieces to understand the severity of what's happened. So November 1st, 2021, Seth Kenny is on a phone call with Corporal Hancock. At that point, we've heard about Seth Kenny's involvement in this, his effort to pry into what's going on with the prop card and the bullets. And so on that phone call, he's telling Corporal Hancock, then Detective Hancock, that he believes he knows where the live bullet came from. He dials in a guy named Teske, who we heard about yesterday in testimony. Teske gets on the line and Seth says, tell Detective Hancock what you know. And he says, well, Fell Reed dropped off a batch of live ammunition at my business because I have a safer place to store it. And after that, Fell shows up, grabs some of the live ammunition, and leave some behind. And that's what I know. And Seth says, well, that could be from the same batch that killed Helena Hutchins. Could be a match. He says, and it's Del Reed, and it's Hannah Gutierrez Reed. That's the one who's responsible here. Pushing it off on Gutierrez Reed as the source of the live ammunition, just as the state has done in this case. He says, thank you very much. He gets off the phone. Fell says... Fell says, I am, uh, or excuse me, Teske says, I'll take a picture. I'm not in front of my computer, not in front of my ammunition. I'll send it in an hour. He sends a picture of four bullets. Ms. Morrissey is going to hold that up to you and say, these are the four bullets you knew about this. That was from 2021. Detective Hancock does not preserve the other live ammunition that's at Teske's property. Even though he told her this could be from the live ammunition batch that matches the bullet that killed Helena Hutchins. Two years later, November 2nd, 2023, there's a PTI of Teske. Ms. Morrissey's asking questions, and she starts probing further into the live ammunition that Teske had previously said was given to him by Fel Reed. And she says, do you still have some of that ammunition? He says, well, some of it, but I've been out shooting it over the last two years because Detective Hancock did not preserve it over that time period. Ms. Morrissey probes further. Where did it come from? Tell me your story. He says, well, Fell dropped it off. He then picked some up, and he went with Seth Kenny to the 1883 Yellowstone movie where he was teaching people how to shoot with that live ammunition. He then went to another movie with Seth Kenny, teaching people how to shoot with that live ammunition. And Seth Kenny then took a green ammo can with that live ammunition in it and brought it home with it. He says that could be the live ammunition from that green, man green ammo can that killed Helena Hutchins. Ms. Morrissey says, I want you to preserve that. And do you think there's any evidence that this was sabotage. And he says, well, actually, Seth Kenny called me while Rust was shooting, telling me he wanted to get Hannah Gutierrez-Reed fired. 
but he didn't know how to do it because he was concerned about upsetting Fel Reed, significant armor in the business, as your honor knows. And so he says, I don't have evidence that there was sabotage, but that's what I know, and I still have this ammunition. As we know, Sarah Zachary, the one who threw the live bullets away, or bullets away, we don't know, live or not, threw bullets away after the incident on Rust, admitted that, texting with Seth Kenny, angry with Hannah, on the license, to the, the ATF report for the Pieta that was involved in this accident, she was on set. They were close, we know that. And so, Ms. Morrissey says, you hold on to that evidence, and I'll come get it, in essence. She never does. November 2023. Fast forward to March 6, 2024. The end of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's trial. Teske's in Santa Fe. Sees what happens. Shows up at the sheriff's office, as we heard from Ms. Popple. And delivers that live ammunition that Hancock had not preserved, that Ms. Morrissey had not collected, that he believed could be from the same batch, from that same green ammo can that we care about, that matched the bullet that killed Elena Hutchins. We heard, Your Honor, what Miss Popple did with it. They buried it. I'd like to say charitably that it was under the pile of the 5501 information that they didn't disclose, but that's even too charitable because they put it under a different case with a different number. We asked March 26th, we want all of the ammunition from the rust set that you've collected. April 16th, we show up for that viewing. We want all the live ammunition from the rust set that you collected. It's not there. After Teske had turned it in, after Ms. Popple had created the report, the supplemental report she said she created when she took this in and did not disclose to us, it was not there. Now, Your Honor, we don't know if it's a live ammunition match or not. But what we do know is the state had it. It's disclosable under Giglio. It's disclosable under 5501. And there's a case on point, Your Honor, State versus Allison, where a criminal defendant had been charged with conspiracy, aggravated assault, dishonest, belated crimes. And he had an arrest record in the prosecution's possession. He had a statement and an arrest record. It was not disclosed under 5501. The criminal defendant shows up at trial and testifies. He's a great guy, honest, no criminal record. The prosecution whips out his arrest record and his statement, disclosable under 5501, which it never disclosed, and said not true. Court breaks. Defendant says, you didn't disclose that under 5501. And the prosecution says, who cares? He's up on the stand lying. This would not have been favorable to him at all. And so... Judge, I want a continuance. Give them a continuance. That's their remedy. Come back tomorrow. I'll disclose everything. I'll make it all right. And then we'll continue. Trial of court says, fine, I'll give you that continuance. Limited remedy. You'll have all the information. Do with it what you will. If it's negative, fine. Right. If it's not, that's for you to use a trial. He's convicted. It gets appealed. It ends up in the Supreme Court of New Mexico. That decision was reversed. A continuance is not adequate in those circumstances. They're in the middle of trial. The defendant would have done things differently. The defendant would have opened differently, would have asked questions differently. Too much about where the source, in this case, of the live bullet came in before this was presented at trial. The court said it doesn't matter if the defendant knew or should have known of it. What we're talking about here is not the defendant's knowledge, not whether it matches, not matches, not whether his criminal arrest record would have hurt him or not. We're talking about the conduct of the prosecution. And that's exactly what we're talking about here, Your Honor. We're talking about a prosecution that didn't preserve those bullets, that didn't collect them at all, that didn't turn them over, that we already have a 5501 culpability finding with respect to the last set of information. And Your Honor, the bottom line is we've got 5501 violation, culpability, we don't need to show bad faith. We've got a Brady violation. We've got a Giglio violation. Now, this is critical evidence in the case that was never disclosed to us. We heard Ms. Morrissey say, I'm going to have Detective Hancock come in and testify. 
We could have Ms. Popple testify. They could say it doesn't match, et cetera, et cetera. It does not matter. It did not matter in Allison. We were entitled to it. A continuance is not a sufficient remedy. This case should be dismissed, Your Honor. This is over and over and over and over again. And Your, Your Honor, you've given them a fair chance. You said, grand jury, as Mr. Spiro said, you said, I'm going to give you a remedy on Trumbetta. I'm going to, I'm going to limit it. I'm going to give you your remedy. You've given them more than enough opportunities, Your Honor. This is not the first time. It's not the second time. It's not even the third time. It's time for this case to be dismissed, Your Honor. That's what Brady requires. That's what Giglio requires. That's what 5501 requires. As Your Honor knows, we've got remedies in the alternative, but this is the one that's right for this moment. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. So there we have a case for dismissal. You may note that I will be leaving the footage to play a little long in this video as it's hard to edit it down and retain context. There is absolutely nothing about the ammunition that Troy Teske had that has any evidentiary value in the Gutierrez case. It has no evidentiary value in the Baldwin case. Uh, th this, is, this, is, this feels like asking us to go to every sporting goods store, collect all of their 45 caliber ammunition, and send it off for testing. We're not required to do that. It simply doesn't have any evidentiary value, and the defense was aware of it. Um, <clears throat> if the court, let me, let me check my notes real quick. And, and uh, another thing that's really important about the, the transcript of Mr. Teske's uh, pretrial interview is he does not say this is, the, this is the same ammunition that killed Helena Hutchins. He says, that's what Seth Kinney told me. Well, we've interviewed Seth Kinney countless times, and he's testified before your owner, and that is not what he says. He does not support that. So Mr. Teske indicated during his pretrial interview that he had no personal knowledge of whether or not this ammunition had anything to do with what was happening on the set of Rust. That all came from Seth. We investigated Seth. We talked to Seth. Uh, Hannah Gutierrez admits to law enforcement that she loaded the gun. She points out the box of dummy rounds that she was sourcing ammunition from. During her November interview, she holds up a picture of the exact same box and says, I got this from my dad. My dad wanted me to show you. Uh, the boxes of dummy rounds that we used, and it was a spot-on match. She actually indicated that she got the box of dummy rounds from her own father. None of this is exculpatory at all. Uh, this is the exact same batch of ammunition that has already been sent to the FBI and tested because it all came from the same place. There's no reason for us to do it again. Thank you. If this evidence wasn't as important as we say it is, they would have turned it over. The fact that they concealed it, the fact that they put it under a separate document number, didn't disclose the supplemental report, didn't disclose the bullets, didn't bring them to the April 6th evidentiary viewing. If it was that irrelevant, it had no evidentiary value, it would have been there, Your Honor, number one. Number two, Ms. Morrissey does not get to determine what has evidentiary value and what doesn't. 5501 says it's required to be disclosed period, full stop. And in fact, in the Allison case, it was not exculpatory. It was inculpatory. It was the defendant's own arrest record and his own lies to the state. And yet the fact that it was required to be disclosed under 5501 and the fact that it was not meant period, full stop. We're not going to have a mini trial about this in the middle of the trial. That's exactly what the Supreme Court reversed the lower court for doing. What Ms. Morris Moore is asking you to do. It didn't matter. It was inculpatory. But the trial would have been conducted differently. And because it would have been conducted differently, and that's exactly the truth here, this goes to credibility, it goes to the government's bias, improper motivation and incompetence. I'm taking those exact words from the motion in limine ruling that Your Honor made. That goes into evidence. It's relevant to Popple's credibility, to Hancock's credibility. It relates to every single thing we've planned in this entire case, Your Honor. And right in the middle of it, Ms. Morrissey doesn't tell you what was actually turned in. She shows you a picture from 2021, a subset of the rounds that were turned in by Teske, a subset. He said he shot a bunch of rounds in those two years. The picture was only a four. 
This is critical evidence, Your Honor, and whether Seth Kenney is right or wrong or how we debate whether he was involved or not involved, that's completely irrelevant because what we know is we don't have those bullets and they were required to be disclosed so we could put on the case that's fair. And that's exactly what Brady says, Your Honor. Brady says that the administration of justice requires fairness. That was the entire premise of the decision, fairness. And that's all we've wanted from the beginning, Your Honor. And you've given them chance after chance after chance, and you, there are no more chances, Your Honor. Brady says it, Giglio says it, 5501 requires it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Before I, um, and we can take testimony later if, if, if you all want, but I'm going to um, require that the state, in fact, I'm going to order that the state um, by um, 11.30 this morning produce the uh, supplemental report, the, the, whole, the file, the file itself and anything in it, and also the um, the um, uh, rounds may, may that I I'm not finished, okay. and the rounds that um, that um, uh, Ms. Popple took from Mr. Tes Teske. I want the court to understand that last night the defense reached out to Ms. Popple and said, we want you to bring the rounds to court tomorrow, and she got their message, and then they reached out to her again and said, no, never mind. We don't want you to bring the rounds Thank to you, court Thank you, Ms. Morrissey. Thank you, Ms. Morrissey. I, I don't. Okay, where are they? They're here. They're, I'll, I'll go get them. All right. The case seems to be falling to pieces. The judge requests testimony from familiar face Marissa Popple. So anywhere, I can just cut into it. There should be a, there's a separate All right. area. I'm going to have you. This is unusual, but if you all don't mind, and if there's any objection, I'm going to have her step down, and when I ask her a question about which is which, she will put it out. Is that all right with everybody? Okay, so I just need you to have some gloves. The missing rounds of ammunition are presented to the court and examined in front of the jury. The different types of rounds sorted into piles. Do you recognize any of these types of um, bullets to have been gathered on the Hannah Gutierrez, on the rust set? The Starline brass with silver primer are similar to what was collected on the set. And everything that was collected on set went to Ziegler? Yes. All right. Thank you. I don't have any further questions, but I'll certainly allow since Scott, you know, and they can break to get I don't know if you want to be there with her or what. Maybe she can take the witness chair. Um, I'm just going to pass the witness up because we're not fully set up. The copy of the stent shell casing. That is recovered on the steen of rough. It and you would agree with me, right, that it's the same as the bottom of the bullets that you just divided to the court. Yes, it Starline brass forty five Colt with a silver primer. So when I asked you yesterday, didn't he turn in ammunition that matched the ammunition that um killed Ms. Hutchins. It's true that he did, correct? And I did not recall at that time. Oh, oh, I, oh I understand that that's your, your position, but that's what in fact happened. Would you agree? I would not use the word match without there being an additional analysis. Well, who got to decide whether there would be additional analysis? Uh, that was not myself. It wasn't a defense though, right? We didn't know about it. I don't know what you were aware of. Okay. Well, you know that we came to have an evidence viewing where we asked to see every single round that could be related to the rust set, and this was hidden from us. You do know that. This was not hidden. This was not hidden? This was under a case number. It was documented. I was instructed to document it under this case number. Okay, so in this case that's under the rust investigation case number, you would agree with me there's hundreds of, of, of things that you inventoried, right? Yes. There are hundreds of police reports that all relate to the same case number, right? Yes. The one thing that seems to have been put under a different case number is just this one discovery of the actual ammunition that matches the ammunition from the set of rust. 
this was put under a dock information of someone coming in claiming to have rounds that were not utilized in a case. Uh, okay, well, let's examine that for a second. When Seth Kenny comes into the precinct and he gives you ammunition, you vouchered it, right? I was instructed to collect the ammunition from Seth Kenny. Well, let me take a step back for a, a second just to make something clear. Um, Mr. Your Papal, you're, you're following orders, right, when you're doing these things, correct? Can you please stop referring to me as investigator because it's creating a misnomer? Okay, well, how would you? I, I apologize. I'm, I'm a crime scene technician. I'm not an investigator. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm only doing that because it's shorter than crime scene technician. CST works. Perfect. Okay, CST Popple. Um, when you took the, um, the you're, you're effectively following orders when you're deciding whether to voucher this or voucher the Seth Kenny evidence, right? You keep using the word voucher, and I'm not sure what context you're using it. Yeah, I apologize for that word choice also. When you inventory and make a report, I think your testimony is you're doing it at the direction of supervisors. Is that fair? Most of the time, yes. Okay. So when Seth Kenny walks into the precinct and gives you ammunition and says it's from the Rust case, you all that you all inventoried it, right? Yes. You took photos of it, right? Yes. You put it under the Rust case number, right? Yes. You turned it over to the defense, right? Uh, according to my knowledge, yes. Okay. Somebody else comes in to the precinct, okay? A man named, named Troy Teske, right? Yes. Who is a former police officer, right? I believe he stated that, yes. Okay. And, and I assume you all have the diligence to be able to confirm that, right? I do not know if it was confirmed or not. Okay. And he comes in and he also tells you he has evidence, right? He told us three years later after a trial that... He had evidence that the defense wanted him to use that he no longer wanted to hold on to. Okay, let's break that down for a second, right? Mr. Teske isn't involved in your meetings with the prosecutors and Corporal Hancock's meetings with the prosecutors up until the trial, was it? Not that I know of. Okay, so doesn't it make sense that he would have seen the trial on t television, been completely outraged at what he was watching, not trusted law enforcement, and then walked it into the precinct? Doesn't that make sense? I do not know what would make sense to Mr. Teske. Okay, didn't he in fact tell you, I don't trust this Morrissey and the prosecutors? He did not state that to me. He, he, he didn't on your oath? You sure about that? I do not recall him stating that. So he turns this, this round in, and you, when he turns it in, obviously recognize it as Starline Brass, Nickel Primer, Colt 45, correct? Yes. Okay. So it's not as if he came in and just turned in a bunch of shells, right? He did turn in a whole bunch of shells. Okay. But he did just turn in shells, right? He turned in multiple different 45 rounds. I'll ask the question a third time. He didn't just turn in shells, did he? He turned in multiple 45 rounds. Including the rounds that matched the round that struck Ms. Hutchins, right? Again, I wouldn't use the word match without further analysis. And, and the reason that we don't have further analysis is you all didn't send this to the FBI for further analysis, did you? We did not. Right, because if you had, it would have potentially proven the fact that all along, this ammunition did come from Seth Kenny. Isn't that true? What I was informed of by Mr. Teske was that the ammunition originated from Joe Swanson. And then went in the green ammo can to Seth Kenny. I do not recall him speaking about a green ammo can. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. You know, the other thing that you're saying, I, I, I took you at first to be saying, well, it's just a bunch of ammunition, and now we've gotten to the point where it's actually the same, the same type of ammunition. And then you've also stated in, in your testimony that it's like, well, there's just this guy, Troy Teske, that just walks into the office like it's random. Um, when really Mr. Teske and his involvement in this case was very well known to law enforcement, correct? I had never heard his name before. Okay, but he came in and he said, I'm here um, to give evidence about the Rust case, right? He stated that he had evidence the defense had wanted and he no longer wanted to hang on to it. Well, and he was the one using the word evidence. Folks? You said to him when you met him down at the first floor of the precinct, 
you were called because you were the evidence, the person in charge of the evidence, the CST, right? Yes. Okay. And, and he said, thank, thank goodness it's you. You're the perfect person to take this because you know all about the Rust case. And you said, I know all about the Rust case, right? I don't recall that. Do you deny that? No. Okay. And then he said, and then he said to you, <clears throat> this ammunition was in Seth Kenny's possession. And you said Seth Kenny's law enforcement is well aware of Mr. Kenny, right? I don't recall that. So, so you take this ammunition on March 6th, right? Yes. The standard operating procedure for the Santa Fe Police Department says you're supposed to make your report within 24 hours, right? Correct. Okay. So tell the court, did you make the report within 24 hours? I'm fairly certain that our SOP is that evidence should be submitted within 24 hours. I am not certain on when the reports are supposed to be submitted. Did you want to take your answer back? Yes, I do. I apologize. Yes. Well, we can enter that SOP to evidence. In, in this case, many times, there are police reports that are done the same day that the incident occurs. Can you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Um, how much longer after this revelation did you do your report? I believe it was... Uh, oh, I apologize. I can refer to my report to refresh my memory. Oh, I, ha- I have puppy. Uh, I believe it was the following month that the report was made. Yeah, it was approximately a month later, right? Yes. What happened during that month, CST Papa? Uh, To be fairly honest, I went out of town to visit my dying mother. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Were you out of town that entire month? I don't believe it was the entire month, no. Okay. Um, there's there, Who was involved in the word choice in this report? Myself. You didn't have any input? Because this doesn't look like the same language you use in the other reports. Well, on a normal basis, I don't have conversations with people involved in cases. Uh-huh. Um, but there was also other officers there that were aware of this. Corporal Hancock was aware of this, correct? Uh, she was notified about Yes. Okay, and so is your your supervisor who was there with you, correct? Yes. So you're not telling me in this court that you had no input at all in the tra- in the drafting of this document, are you? It was reviewed by my supervisor. I don't believe any corrections were made to it or requested by him. You know, it's just there's a funny sentence in it. It says, <clears throat> as it says, I've I've never seen in a, in a police a, a police report. You tell me if you've ever seen this in a police report in an entire career says, it should be noted that this is not actual evidence from the death investigation collected by SFSO detectives. You are not reading my section of the report. You are reading what was written by Lieutenant Brian Brandle. Ah, I was going to say, it doesn't look like you are writing. So the lieutenant writes in, thank you for clarifying that. I just got this report, as you know, right? Um, The lieutenant writes in, it should be noted that this is not actual evidence from the death investigation collected by SFSO detectives. Did I read that right? I believe so. Okay. Um, In your career, going back to when you were at CST in Florida, all the way through to present, have you ever seen such a sentence in a police report in your entire career? Not that exact sentence, no. Yeah, me neither. Um, After this occurred, did this cause you... um, did this cause you concern, CST Popple, that this, this was handled this way? It did not. And as I asked you yesterday, you actually said when you were meeting with Mr. Teske, this is the ammunition that we've been looking for from the Rust set, didn't you? I don't recall stating that. But you're not denying that? I'm not denying that. So, the... F- I don't know whether the most critical evidence in this case is the gun that was sent off to be destroyed or the round that killed Ms. Hutchins. It probably is the round that killed Ms. Hutchins. 
Um, would you agree with that, that those are probably the two most important pieces of evidence in this entire case? I'm sorry, can you please restate your sure. long question? Sure. The, would you agree with me that the two most critical <laughs> items in this case from an evidentiary perspective were probably the firearm um, in question and the live ammunition that struck Ms. Hutchins, right? I would say the firearm and the live ammunition from the set. Okay. And so the firearm, which we've had hearings, discussions about, was ultimately broken beyond repair by law enforcement, right? Was broken by the FBI lab. Okay. And the, and the report that was issued by the experts for the prosecution about that firearm and whether or not it had been modified before was buried also by the prosecutors, correct? I do not know about that report. Okay. And then we can turn to this a second most critical piece of evidence in this case. And um, this was also buried by law enforcement, correct? No. No, it wasn't. Okay. The um, request from the defense of all ammunition was um, taken by law enforcement to not mean the ammunition that you recovered that matched the ammunition that struck Ms. Hutchins? I don't believe they looked at all the ammunition that day. Well, no, no, but the request was all ammunition. So I'm asking you, did law enforcement interpret that request to not include this critical evidence? All of the items that were pulled for the case were under the rest case number. Which was a, a perfect plan. You're asking me if there was a plan? Well, I'm saying whether there was or there wasn't, it worked out pretty well, right? I'm not sure what you're getting at. There was a request to view the evidence from Rust. That is the evidence that was pulled. Well, your report said is this is evidence from Rust, and then it just puts it under a different case number, and the lieutenant then writes that sentence in saying this isn't evidence from Rust, right? My report states that Mr. Teske believed that it was related to Rust, and then I listed the case number next to that. Do you remember when we start, well, do you remember when we started um, our, uh, my examination of you yesterday, how I sort of said to you, the way you know what evidence to find is by what people tell you? Do you remember that? Yes. And that when you're at a burglary and somebody says, oh, you better pick up that glove, you don't know that that person's telling the truth or not, but you pick up the glove, right? Uh, depending on the circumstances of the case, possibly. And here, a, me a retired member of law enforcement walks into the precinct, who's known to law enforcement, who turns in the matching ammunition, who tells you it's involved in the case, where there's tons of corroboration, both by what he provides and the history that law enforcement knows about this man. And you put it under a different case number, right? I'm sorry, what was your question in that long statement? You put it under a different case number. Yes, as I was instructed to do so. Things are getting fiery. The witness is passed over to Carrie Morrissey for cross-examination. So what? But here, here, here's the only thing I'm trying to do, and I, and I don't mean to be frustrating. The only thing I'm trying to do is make sure that if this court grants this motion to dismiss, that I have made a full record, and, and I am entitled to do that. So I am getting my witnesses over here so that I can make a full record on this issue. Well, what's interesting to, to me, to be quite honest is that yesterday, you didn't even want to do a written reply. You wanted to just give a, an oral response. I never saw these. I've never seen these, and I never saw the report. Mm -hmm. I've, I have absolutely never seen these until this morning. Right. I've never seen the report. So ask morning. questions of this witness, and then you, we, you can line up your witnesses, and I'll see. But we're going to go with Hancock after this. Ms. Popple, I, I just presented to the court that I've never seen these until this morning. Do you agree with that? Yes. You've never shown me these or, or I've never come in to see them. Is that right? Correct. Have you ever provided me that doc report? No, I have not. Okay. So, uh, do you know who Troy Teske is? No, I do not. Um, did, I think we took some testimony from you yesterday uh, that he is the friend of Thelraid. Uh, 
I believe that was stated, but I did not know that information. Okay, so let me ask it this way. If Troy Teske, who provided this ammunition, is a friend of Hannah Gutierrez's dad, and if these bullets... I'd ask the prosecutor not to be touching those with her bare hands. They be, they rolled around for three years. Okay. Um, if if these bullets um, match the ones that were on the set of rust, is that evidence, additional evidence, that Hannah Gutierrez provided the live ammunition to the set of rust? Yes. And has she been convicted for that? Yes. Is this evidence that Seth Kinney provided live ammunition to the set of rust? No. So let me ask you, Ms. Popple, if you buried it, how did the defense attorneys know to cross-examine you on it yesterday? I do not know. Do you have any idea when the defense attorneys learned about this ammunition? No, I do not. Do you know who they learned it from? No. Those are some important inquiries. Those are all the questions I have for Ms. Popple, but... We'd like to take additional testimony. The much talked about Seth Kenny, supplier of a large amount of the blanks and dummies to the production of rust, is called to the stand. In terms of boxes of dummy rounds, how many boxes of dummy rounds did you provide to the set of rust? A single box of 50, 45 Colt dummy rounds. That was the that was the single box. The rest of them were of different calibers and were not contained in similar boxes. So you provided one box of dummy rails. That's correct. Where did you get those? Those came off the set, of the, off the prop truck of 1883. And did you inventory them or do anything with them before you provided them to the set of rust? Yeah, so, uh, Yes, there was, I, I essentially grabbed a double grocery bag and, and dummies because I knew they were running short. Or I'd heard that they were running short on set. And I thought, well, just in case, I'll grab, I'll grab some extra for them. And so from that plastic bag, the following morning, because again, I had to sleep in the van because there was hundreds of thousands of dollars of weapons and it's Albuquerque. So I slept in the van armed and... Uh, the next morning brought that bag and brought them into the, into the office um, and, took, and took a look at them. They were unusual in that they had been antiqued. They were one of a couple of thousand that had been antiqued en masse. And they were so corroded, they didn't look right at all. So I sat there and each one took about a minute to polish before it had an appropriate patina. And I also noted that they that a few of them had a muddy rattle to them, and I just attributed it to whatever liquid chemical agent that they had soaked the rounds in had infiltrated the interior of the uh, the case. And, had, and again, not a metallurgist, but had done something to the number two lead shot, a single piece that served as a rattle to, to differentiate live from dummies. Did anything from this box that we have here, or this container, Defendant's Exhibit A21, was any of that sent to the set of rest? Absolutely not. The incident happens um, on the 21st of October, and at um, 1.55 p.m., you receive a text message from Sarah Zachary telling you that this has occurred, correct? I think it, was a, it wasn't a telling me that it occurred. It just said emergency in all caps. And you called her, right? I did. I, call, I missed a call from her, received the text. Um, I think I said I'd call her back, and I did. Okay. Within just a, a minute or two. And between the time you provided, whatever it is that you provided to Rust, and the moment you get that emergency text, isn't it fair to say you're not sitting around, you know, daydreaming and wondering and thinking about each round you provide and whatever you provide to the set. You do this for a living. You do it lots of times, right? That's correct. Yeah. But the moment that happens, right, things change, didn't it? What changed? Well, Miss Hutchins died, right? I wasn't aware of that till hours later. You spoke to Miss Zachary five times that night, right? 
I don't recall. Probably. Ms. Zachary, you know, had the shell casing, right, at, at one point that evening? No, I, uh, I don't recall that. You don't recall that? No, that she said she held the spent case from the gun. I don't recall that. Sarah Zachary threw out some of the evidence, correct? I had heard that months and months afterwards that she had thrown out dummy rounds from Jensen Ackles' gun. Months and months? I believe so. Sure about that? Barely. It's been a long time. Right. And the only messages that we have from around that time we're going to look at. But you knew at that moment that you had just provided 45 Starline brass dummies, correct? With nickel primers. Nearly all the dummy rounds I provide are Starline brass. And you would agree with me that anybody who didn't provide that round or brought it out to the set would have every reason to want to deny that, correct? No. Hannah Gutierrez admitted in questioning at the sheriff's office that she brought the box that contained the live rounds. No, she didn't. She actually said she hadn't seen that box, and that's just something that's been fed to you by the prosecutor. Isn't that true? No, I have actually seen the interview. Okay, well, we can pull up that interview if we need to. So, um... The week after the accident, you know that we have some of your text messages, right? Yes. Okay. And um, you weren't sleeping, right? Correct. You were drinking a lot? I don't even remember. You were talking to your cop buddies to try to get advice about the case? I don't recall that. You texted Sarah Zachary in the days that followed. <clears throat> Do not say anything or write anything to anyone, right? Yes, I remember that text. Do nothing, say nothing, write nothing. Correct? Correct. She told you she wanted to get a lawyer, right? Yes. You told her not to get a lawyer, right? In fact, at one point you just said, shh, and with an emoji, right? I don't recall that. Okay. The, the one that you just saw on the screen of you and Mr. Teske. Do you remember that photograph that you just looked at? With the reloads? Yeah. Yes. You actually took a screenshot of that and sent it to Detective Hancock, correct? It sounds like something I would do. I don't recall doing it, but it sounds accurate. Okay. Um, does it sound like... I don't have the photo, so... But... The photo that you took and sent to, of the screenshot that you sent to Detective Hancock, um, it included that line, yes, this is evidence in the accidental death, right? That was my speculation prior to learning that the, the, the live rounds from Rust had nickel primers. Well, sir, that's the problem with your testimony, isn't it? Which is what? In the very same text chain, you ask about nickel primers. So how is it possible that you didn't know about it when you said that this is evidence in the accidental death? Because the, the meeting with Hancock and the text exchange with the picture occurred on November 1st. Two days later, on November 3rd, I had asked by text whether or not any of the rounds had nickel primers. And he replied, Ted Troy Tusky replied, no. You see it on your screen? I do. Okay. And you see, you say, yep, it's evidence in the accidental death, correct? That's on November 1st, yes. Correct. That's what you wrote, sir, right? On well, November 1st, yes. Okay. And, and you didn't say anything about speculating, did you? No. Okay, but when you screenshot this to Detective Hancock, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, let me ask you, after he says, okay, you say, ah, oh, this sucks, but she's seriously trying to blame everyone else for her mistake, Correct. Yes, that's what it says. Okay. So it's, oh, this sucks, but she's trying to blame everybody else, right? Yes. Oh, this sucks that it comes from the same batch, right. but it's really her fault because she loaded into the weapon, right? Well, first off, I pronounced that ug. And then what was the second part of your question? But it's her fault because she loaded into the weapon, correct? Certainly. 
And you said that over and over again as you continue to meet with law enforcement that whatever happened here, it's her fault. She loaded it, correct? Well, certainly she's responsible for loading a live round into a gun on a movie set. Alexandria Hancock returns to the stand. She recounts her meeting with Seth Kenny when they met to discuss the items he supplied the production of Rust. Carrie Morrissey speaks about a video from a body cam that she and Alexandra Hancock viewed while the court was at lunch. The judge, who clearly has her mind on something else, interrupts to ask for all the exhibits which were admitted during Marissa Popple's testimony. Let me flush out. Let me see what's in front of it. These are enough. These are enough. These are enough. Okay? I'm good. I'm good. All right, let me just use the, the, these, okay? Let me just see if I'm going to... I might ask for more later. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt your questions. No, no, no. Due to Mr. Teske's refusal to speak to you, were you ever able to tie the items that he dropped, dropped off at the Sheriff's Department to the set of rest? No. Given that this is a motion hearing, um, and, if, and if the court wants me to do this a different way, please tell me, um, over the lunch break, were we able to obtain the video and watch it? Yes. Did you hear what Mr. Teske said in the video regarding whether or not these came from the set of Rust? He said that they were not from the set. That's what he said on the video? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to get... Cross-examine off of this. Sure, so, uh, and I can get it to him. Uh, well, you are going to give it to him, and, and this... This testimony, I, he can call her back up if he wants. Absolutely. But, sure. Um, at certain point early on in this case, you entertained the possibility that this was an actual sabotage, that somebody could have intentionally placed the lethal bullet onto set, correct? Yes. And you quickly dispensed of that concept, right? I don't think it was quickly dispensed. It was investigated. Okay. And fair to say that if that had happened... That would have been a far different case, right? It could have been. I don't... And so then you turn to the idea of, well, somebody outside of Russ could have placed or been the, the cause of the um, ammunition ending up on set. And you interviewed Seth Kenny. I think you told this court yesterday, 10 times at least, right? Yeah, I, I can't put an exact number, but it was a few times, yes. Right, and that would have been different, a different case also, right? If he had provided them... Yeah. In relation to this case or in relation to the past case? In relation to any case. It, it's hard to say. Well, you were here for investigator... Uh, I'm going to do this again. C.S.T. Popple's testimony yesterday, weren't you? Yes. And you've had an opportunity to view um, this the 45 star line brass that came out of this package today, correct? No. You haven't looked at it yet? No. Okay. I've seen with witness, I think. I, and and, and um, are you aware, as you sit here, that there was 40, 45 long cold Starline brass nickel in the courtroom today from, from C.S.T. Popple? I just found that out today. Okay. So, uh, you were here for this testimony in this courtroom. And let me ask you, Ms. Popple, the ammunition that the Good Samaritan Mr. Teske, the close friend of Hannah Gutierrez's dad, when you see... That ammunition that he brought into you after the conviction, you still have it? Answer, yes. Question, you can bring it in here and you can show it to the jury, right? Answer, yes. And they can see for themselves that it does not match the live ammunition from the set of rust, correct? Yes. And that it is obvious. Just when you look at it, it is not. Yes. Remember that testimony that you were sitting here for? I, yes, I do. And that turns out to be completely false, doesn't it? You're correct. Lieutenant Brian Brandle, the officer who was wearing the body camera, the footage of which was viewed during the lunch break, takes to the stand in order that it can be submitted as evidence. I've got some evidence. You need to this out here? There were Because I, I should probably write out something. I'm old with this. So I've got like a chain. I'll just have to Well, we don't have a chain of SV there. So, yeah, call it Katie and we'll... This character in the video is the person that's often been referred to as the Good Samaritan during the case, who just showed up one day and presented evidence to the Santa Fe Sheriff Department. There are 45 hard to use. And like, They're from the set? Um, no. And no. Okay. No. You want to know the details? 
Could you hear what the gentleman said? Yes. Was he asked if they were from the set? Yes. What was his response? No. It's they never did. Okay, so he brought him out here just in case. I mean, that, but he goes, I can't get it done. And he learned. Sir, do you recall this conversation? Yes, I do. Um, do you know when, when, when Mr. Teske is talking about being called as a witness in the Gutierrez trial, do you recall which side he was being called by? I only learned that when he identified that. What Speaking side? Now, on the defense side. And, and, and when he said that he brought ammunition, but they didn't want to use it, was he referring to the prosecution or the defense? I can... To be... De well, well I, I, if he doesn't, I'm assuming he'll tell me. The defense. Right, and you, um, you know, I don't have all of your police reports for all of your cases every time you get evidence, right? But fair to say sometimes evidence is developed by people coming into the precinct and turning evidence? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, and you write in your report, it should be noted that this is not actual evidence. That's what you write in your report. I believe pertaining to our initial investigation. It should be noted that this is not actual evidence from the death investigation collected by SFSO detectives. That's what you wrote, right? Correct, and it wasn't collected by our detectives for the investigation. The initial investigation. I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? So the evidence that was brought, I was indicating because we didn't know if it was tied to the investigation. And it, uh, Detective Hancock asked that we tie it to a separate case number until further investigation could be completed. So I don't want to, someone or anyone to assume that it was actually evidence that we collected tied to this investigation. And so that was at the direction of, de of Detective Hancock? No, that, I wrote that on my own accord. Well, you may have written that sentence on your own accord, but I think as you just testified, de Detective Hancock, who was at the courthouse with Ms. Morrissey at the time, directed you to put it under a different identification number, correct? Correct, uh, pending further investigation. Okay. Um, you were involved, actually, you're copied on some emails with evidence viewing in this case. I believe so, yes. Right. Um, you have no reason to believe that law enforcement ever showed this evidence to the defense, correct? Correct. I have nothing further for this. Carrie Morrissey calls herself to the stand. I'm not sure if this is standard practice or not, but I'm suddenly getting flashbacks to the court scene in the Orson Welles film, The Lady from Shanghai. All right, Ms. Morrissey voluntarily calling herself as a witness without any requirement by the court to do so, or Mr. Spiro asking her to. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Go ahead. During my investigation of this case and my review of the evidence in this case, I came to understand that there was a large batch of live ammunition that was in the possession of Thel Reed, Hannah Gutierrez's father. I also understood from all of the evidence and testimony that a portion of that batch of ammunition that belonged to Thel Reed was taken by Thel Reed and Seth Kinney to the 1883 Cowboy Training Camp. When that was over, leftover ammunition was taken back to PDQ props. Seth Kinney took some of the ammunition from that container that he had brought back from Texas and turned it in to the sheriff's department. And it appeared to me that he did it to try to exonerate himself. They took it from Mr. Kinney and they tagged it into evidence under the Rust case. Law enforcement then executed a search warrant at PDQ Props and they took the entire container. Um, and I, I will say that I do agree as I recall, although I don't have it in front of me, I do agree that uh, the search warrant didn't really require law enforcement to take everything, 
but it was my understanding that Mr. Kenny gave them everything so that they would have it and could tag it into evidence. Portions of that ammunition were then sent to the FBI for testing so that they could be compared to the live rounds that were found on the set of rust. The FBI testing demonstrated that the live rounds that were taken from PDQ props that were originally in Texas did not match the live rounds on the set of rust. And that's testimony that we heard during the Gutierrez trial. So what ended up happening was Mr. Bowles, Ms. Gutierrez's lawyer, put Mr. Teske on a witness list and was intending to call him as a witness to the Gutierrez trial. I conducted a pretrial interview of Mr. Teske, and I, I want to back up. I did at this point have some understanding that Mr. Teske had had contact with law enforcement regarding these rounds that he still had in Arizona. So these are rounds that never left Arizona. They were always in the possession of Thel Reed and Troy Teske. They never went to Texas. They never came to New Mexico. That's what all of the evidence indicated. So I understood that Detective Hancock had communication with Mr. Teske about trying to get those rounds, and Detective Hancock was unable to get those rounds from Mr. Teske. I did not find that particularly concerning because those rounds had never left Arizona. The filming of Rust was in the state of New Mexico. And the rounds that were taken from, from PDQ went from Arizona to Texas to Albuquerque. So ammunition that is in the state of Arizona that has never left Arizona did not strike me that it had significant evidentiary value. Then... Oh, oh, and I will tell, I will say, I believe I actually saw a photo of it at that point in time. I was able to look at the ammunition myself, and it was visibly dissimilar than the rounds from the set of rust. Corporal Hancock indicated that she was going to tag them into evidence, and she was going to create what she called a doc report. And I said, great, do that. I was not aware at that point in time that a doc report would not have the same case number as Rust. I was not aware at that point in time that it would not be linked to the Rust case number. I understood that he had dropped off ammunition that I believed to not look similar to the ammunition from the set of Rust. And I had no idea that it wasn't going to have the same case number. I want to show the court, though, when Mr. Teske showed up to testify with the, live, with the ammunition that Mr. Bowles told him to bring to the state of New Mexico, he was not called as a witness, and Mr. Bowles said, I'm not taking that ammunition from you. That's why. Because these are photographs from Hannah Gutierrez's cell phone extraction, and they show spot-on match for the live rounds found on the set of Rust. This is clearly the reason that Mr. Bull said, you and your ammunition better get out of here because it would not have hurt the case, the state's case against Hannah Gutierrez. It would have been the best evidence I could have hoped for. When you took over this case, um, the investigator handling the case, Mr. Schilling, left the case, correct? At my request, yes. The paralegal that was handling this case with you left the case, Mr. Todd? At my request, yes. 
Well, the first prosecutor that was working with you on this case, you selected, correct? I did. And he resigned too? I wouldn't say that he resigned, no. Okay. He didn't stay on the case for the Alec Baldwin trial, correct? No, and he indicated that that was because he represented a labor union that's a national labor union, and he was not expecting the trial to be set so quickly. He wasn't expecting it to be set in July. So when he realized that the trial was going to be set in July, he was going to be in collective bargaining agreements for his national labor union, and he wasn't going to be able to have enough time. Erlinda Johnson, the next prosecutor selected, resigned from the case today. She did. Based in part on the conduct we're here discussing, correct? Uh, I believe that Ms. Johnson uh, uh, has... Ms. Johnson didn't want their... My understanding is, is that she didn't agree with the decision to have a public hearing. On July 1st in this matter, you served a certificate of compliance with 5501, correct? I did. And um, you never turned over the report for any of the evidence that we're talking about here at this hearing, correct? Uh, let's take it one at a time. Um, I did not turn over the report. I didn't have a copy of the report. Um, the rounds that were left at the Sheriff's Department by Troy Teske, I have absolutely no reason to believe that they are relevant to the incident that took place on the set of Rust. These are rounds that were in the possession of Bell Reed and never left the state of Arizona. Um, you also did not um, allow the defense to view that evidence at any point during our request to review evidence in this case. I had never seen it, and I didn't realize that it wasn't under the same case number because I'm not a law enforcement officer and I don't work at the sheriff's department. But uh, you are right. And, and you can see that they are Starline Brass... S Silver 45, right? I can. Uh, and, and this is the best evidence against Hannah Gutierrez. Yeah, you've said that a couple of times. Um, any favorable evidence you understand as a prosecutor has to be turned over to the defense, correct? I do. Any evidence that could be used as a defense to potentially be favorable has to be turned over to the defense. Absolutely. So the third Hague report that never got turned over to the defense, you understand that that's Brady evidence? I did, yes. Okay. And you also failed to turn that over in this case as well, correct? It, what it, and let me let, let me give you a full answer to your question. When the second Hague report came in, and I provided all of this to the defense, I sent it to the person who is managing the discovery server and asked them to upload it. It wasn't until I realized during pretrial interviews that it wasn't there that there was a problem with it. So I then attempted to figure out what the problem was and it was indicated to me that it appeared that the formal paralegal who was working for the special prosecutor had removed it. So we then immediately provided it. Then during the pretrial interview of Mr. Haig, it was brought to my attention that the defense did not have the August 31st report that indicated that the gun functioned fine, perfectly fine, and that was provided immediately. I went back, I checked my email, I could see that I received it from Mr. Haig and failed to forward it on to be uploaded. And I provided it as soon as I was aware that you did not have it. Uh, the, the fact that nobody at the Hannah Goodyear's retrial um, cross-examined Mr. Haig about the report didn't clue you into the fact that nobody had the report? Um, actually, it didn't, and I'd like to address that. The reason that it didn't clue me in is because Hannah Gutierrez's defense was that the gun worked perfectly. Uh, the, the defense in Hannah Gutierrez was never interested in any evidence that there was an issue with the gun because if there was an issue with the gun, it damaged her case. So what you could see, if you watched the trial or saw any of the transcripts, the defense actually brought in their own expert to say that the gun worked perfectly. So they had no interest in that information. 
And and actually, you elicited testimony from Mr. Haig um, at that trial that was inconsistent, at least partially inconsistent, as the court's aware, with his third report, correct? Tell, tell me what you're referring to, and I'll answer your question. Well, there was a whole hearing about this where you saw this, and you saw me go back and forth with Mr. Haig for 25 minutes, so I don't... I agree, but I need to know what you're talking about for me to answer your question. Okay. If you can't answer the question, you can't answer the question. I'll move on. I'm happy to, but... The, 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 you say that the, the extent of the communications you have about the doc report, um, as you, you relate to the court, is that all you said in response was, great, do that? That's your testimony? Yeah, I, I, I assumed that it was going to be tied to the same case number. So I said, great, do it, file a report. No follow-up questions? No. Um, because I had a picture of the ammunition that didn't match the ammunition from the set of rust. No concerns in your mind when you got the case file and you turned it over to us that it wasn't included? Absolutely not. There's a, there, there's a terabyte of discovery. I didn't know whether this two-page police report had been provided. And in addition to that, I had no reason to believe and still have no reason to believe that those rounds have anything to do with these cases i think this is what they refer to as damage limitation um the truth of this matter is um you don't like mr walt baldwin very much do you you know that is absolutely untrue i actually really appreciate mr baldwin's movies i really appreciated uh the acting that he did on saturday night live and i really appreciate his politics um, you told one of the witnesses who disagreed with you during an interview that you thought Mr. Baldwin was a cocksucker. I do not recall saying that. I know that that was something that Mr. Baldwin would say on the set of rust. I don't recall saying that. Do you deny that under oath? Without having more information, I can tell you that I do not recall ever saying that. And if I did say it, I invite you to point it out to me. You called him an arrogant prick to another witness. To who? To what witness? I'm asking you, did you call him an arrogant prick during a witness interview? I don't believe I did. I don't recall. Do you deny that? Without knowing what you're talking about? I, I, all I can tell you is that I can't respond if I don't know what you're talking about. And you, you said also to witnesses that you would teach him a lesson. I never said to witnesses that I would teach him a lesson. Absolutely not. In fact, Mr. Spiro, I want to give a full response to your question. I made every effort in this case to resolve this case with your client in a very favorable way for him. All right, I'm going to move to strike. This is not responsive. It, it is responsive. I don't want to talk about plea negotiations. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not responsive. So I, I have no further questions. All right, do you have any follow-up testimony? All right. I, I, I want to say I have no recollection of, of calling him any of those names. I have invited the defendant to tell me what he's talking about, and he has declined. I want the court to take notice of that. What follows is the judge's address to court, presented without edit. Dismissal with prejudice is a very extreme sanction, and uh, case law is very clear that... Um, because it's uh, very extreme, I have to go through every single element, and I have to make a very good record as to what, why I'm, I'm seeing what I'm seeing. So in order to establish a Brady violation, the defendant must show that the prosecution suppressed evidence, the evidence was favorable to the accused, and the evidence was material to the defense. So let's go through the elements, suppression of evidence. The definition of suppression of elements, this is case versus hatch, is while the first element requires proof that the prosecution suppressed or withheld the evidence in question, it does not require a finding of bad faith or any other culpable state of mind on the part of the prosecutor. This prong is satisfied. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office and the prosecution failed to disclose the supplemental report to defense and provide defense an opportunity to inspect the rounds collected into evidence that Mr. Teske gave. Is the evidence favorable to the accused? The second Brady element is whether the suppressed evidence was favorable to the accused, either as impeachment or exculpatory evidence. This prong is satisfied. 
The suppressed evidence is favorable to the accused. It is impeachment evidence, has even been offered in this trial as impeachment evidence, and is potentially exculpatory to the defense. Critically, the exculpatory value cannot be analyzed at such a late juncture because of the non-disclosure. Is the evidence material? Well, post-trial discovery of evidence under Brady requires a reasonable probability that the result of the proceeding would have been different. Discovery of evidence during trial requires an evaluation of whether the late tender has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it impacts the fundamental fairness of the proceedings, and that is uh, State versus Corte Castro. This evidence is material. The late discovery of this evidence during trial has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it has impacted the fundamental fairness of the proceedings. The defense is not in a position to test the state's theory as to the source of the live rounds that killed Ms. Hutchins. I'm also going to take a look at Harper, State versus Harper. The assessment of sanctions depends upon the extent of the government's culpability weighed against the amount of prejudice to the state. Quoting Chenard. Let's go through culpability. Our case law generally provides that the refusal to comply with a district court's discovery order only rises to the level of exclusion or dismissal where the state's conduct is especially culpable, such as where evidence is unilaterally withheld by the state in bad faith or all access to the evidence is precluded by state intransience. The state is highly culpable for its failure to provide this discovery to the defendant. The state unilaterally withheld a supplemental report. Santa Fe County Sheriff's Officer made the decision, and apparently also with the, with the prosecutor, as pursuant to Hancock's testimony, that the evidence was of no evidentiary value and failed to connect the evidence to the instant case. The case agent, as well as pursuant to Hancock's testimony, Ms. Morrissey, was aware of the new evidence and yet did not make an effort to disclose it to defense. The state's willful withholding of this information was intentional and deliberate. If this conduct does not rise to the level of bad faith, it certainly comes so near to bad faith as to show signs of scorching. Prejudice. When discovery has been produced late, prejudice does not accrue unless the evidence is material and the disclosure is so late that it undermines the definition the defendant's preparation for trial. The court concludes that this conduct is highly prejudicial to the defendant. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and this disclosure during the course of trial is so late that it undermines the defendant's preparation for trial. There is no way for the court to right this wrong. Lesser sanctions under Harper. Trial courts possess broad discretionary authority to decide what sanction to impose when a discovery order is violated, State versus Lemire. The sanction of dismissal is the only warranted remedy. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and a mistrial would not be based upon manifest necessity. Further, the sanction of dismissal is warranted in this case. The state has repeatedly made representations to defense and to the court that they were compliant with all their discovery obligations. Despite their repeated representations, they have continued to fail to disclose critical evidence to the defendant. Brady and Harper are satisfied. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted. Court also has power, inherent power. Per State v. Lemire, where discovery violations inject needless delay into the proceedings, courts may impose meaningful sanctions to effectuate their inherent power and promote efficient judicial administration. The state's discovery violation has injected a needless and curable delay into the instant jury trial. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted to ensure the integrity of the judicial system and the efficient administration of justice. Your motion to dismiss with prejudice is granted. Now, with respect to the jury, I don't imagine you all want to return on Monday. I will take care of the jury. And that concludes the final day of the trial. Dismissed with prejudice, meaning it cannot be retried. Maybe the family will pursue the case in civil court, but that's a story for another day. Alec Baldwin is an innocent man in the eyes of the law and should be treated accordingly. Please note that I am not a lawyer and I offer no legal advice. Any mistakes contained herein are my own. I'm Scott Kingsnorth and I'm making a movie.